a future president shaving a billionaire's head, an illegal occupation of territory in the Middle East, a decades-long pattern of sexual harassment and cover-ups, and a body in Hampshire. What if I told you that these events were connected to a centuries-old organisation? What if I told you how that organisation was funded by the Rothschild family? It would sound like a conspiracy, but really, it's the absurd history of Veolia. This is a story about power and origins, and how our essential needs for water, sanitation and waste are wrenched out of democratic control and ran for profit by a corporation steeped in colonialism and corruption. You may not have heard of Veolia, but they know you. As the world's largest utilities company, they manage your bins, your water supply, or they have stakes in the media that you consume. They sit on UN committees and take control of utility companies of bankrupt nations. They decommission weapons and sponsor sports games. And their story begins in 1853 with Napoleon the Bird. The nephew of the original Napoleon, Charles Louise Napoleon Bonaparte positioned himself by bigging up his dead uncle. After a landslide election win, the fledgling French constitution forbade him from running again, so naturally, he staged a coup. Instigating the Second French Empire, Napoleon began setting up huge sanitation projects. This was a time of frequent, deadly cholera outbreaks. Contemporary hygiene identified the need for improved water management in order to stop this illness spreading. To execute sanitation reforms, Napoleon founded a new private company by imperial decree. It was called Compagnie Générale de O, and is the origin of what would one day become Veolia. CGE was funded by selling shares to the French elite and to international investors, raising over a billion pounds in today's money, the lion's share of which came from a Rothschild family. This new dictator-backed capitalist venture needed management, and those who helped bring Napoleon to power wanted rewards. Enter Henri Simeon. A member of the Elysee party, he oversaw Napoleon's coup and was rewarded with a role in the Lyon Mediterranean Railway Company, the predecessor to France's National Railway. He then oversaw the Paris Beautification Commission, appointing Baron Haussmann, who designed the city of Paris as we know it today. He then took over the management of Compagnie Générale de O. The company was given a 100-year contract with Lyon's water services, and soon acquired a similar contract in Paris. It then spread internationally to Venice, Porto, and Constantinople. As CGE grew, it and its management rode the coattails of colonialism. At the time, France was becoming the second largest empire, and where imperialism went, the country's domestic industry followed. As France solidified colonial occupation in Algeria, its state-backed private enterprises went with it. CGE, what we now call Veolia, could only have begun and could only have thrived due to the patronage of Napoleon and his fellow colonialists. A hundred years after its founding, CGE provided water for 8 million French citizens. With the foundation of NATO, CGE secured water contracts for military bases across Europe. For freedom and for peace. However, CGE's direction began to shift with the appointment of Guy de Journe as its leader. They ventured away from utilities and into entertainment with the 1983 foundation of Canal Plus. The acquisition of Pathé gave them control of British Sky Broadcasting, this trajectory culminating in the purchase of Universal Music Group. They became responsible for the distribution of Weinstein Corporation films and world wrestling entertainment. Beyond this, CGE has also held shares in companies from Activision, Gameloft, the Paddington Bear Company, and many more. As their portfolio expanded from a titular water company, CGE rebranded to Vivendi, divided between Vivendi Environmental and Vivendi Entertainment. With this rebrand also came an avalanche of corruption. In the 1990s, two-thirds of Vivendi's board were under investigation for corruption, and CEO Jean-Marie Messier would later be found guilty of misappropriating corporate funds in order to buy a luxury New York apartment, at the same time as 13 billion euros was wiped off his company's valuation. Amidst this chaos, Vivendi Environmental was spun off to form Veolia. Under Veolia alone, over 2,000 subsidiaries are housed, operating across 48 countries, with projects covering waste, water treatment, railways, weapons decommissioning, and many more. I had intended to draw these out, but it is incredibly nebulous. This is just the structure of water services by country and subsidiary networks. Imagine this multiplied across all areas of interest. Take London's waste collection. From 2013 to 2020, Veolia provided household waste for collection in these boroughs, but then other boroughs were still relying on Veolia facilities, and corporations would privately contract Veolia for commercial waste. But who cares? Why is it important to think about this company and its quirky history? The whole point of the services that they provide is invisibility. We don't think about where our water comes from, and we don't care where it goes. But the prevalence of private utility providers means that citizens get a bad deal. Profits from bills are directed to shareholders and executives, and with the French government currently being Veolia's largest shareholder, 
it means that one polity's essential services are a cash cow for another's. We have already seen how ill-managed Veolia's executives were in utilising these profits, and when their revenue isn't being diverted towards luxury goods, it's going forward to fund controversial enterprises. Veolia has been instrumental in the Israeli illegal occupation of Palestine by building light railway systems in contested territory. This shows how erroneous the idea of private utility companies are, and how they erode at the ability for the state to provide for its citizens, while at the same time, the citizens' bills are being misappropriated. But this is a generic argument that could be levied at any private utility company. Veolia isn't some generic big corporation that leeches off private public partnerships. It has a unique history, the themes of which are now baked into its corporate culture and continue to be seen in how it operates today. Without the support of a dictator and the capital of a French elite and rich through colonial ventures, Veolia could not have operated. From its inception, the company has been directed towards extracting resources from the masses to benefit an elite few, leaving colonialism and anti-democratic fever baked into its organisation. This creates a fundamentally disempowering business model. Veolia's profit margins rest on the knowledge that you can't have a say in their operation. This is perfectly encapsulated in the ongoing Flint, Michigan water crisis. Under pressure from a governor priding himself on his business mindsets, the city of Flint switched their long-standing water supply, Lake Huron, to what was previously the supply of last resort, the Flint River. Flint. Flint. Here, here, here. Almost immediately, residents reported discoloured water and strange illnesses. Independent studies found high levels of lead in the water. This research is concerning. These I'll results are concerning. Not until 2015 did Governor Rick no Snyder admit that any problem existed, and this was only after scores of residents were found to have lead in their bloodstreams. The governor should resign Taking place in the midst of a presidential election, it shocked the world. Presidential debates were held in the city, Flint and crisis became a key issue in campaigns. Wrinkled. But what was Veolia's role here? Well, in 2015, Veolia and North America were hired to consult on water treatment. Internal emails show that the company knew about the lead issues months before the governor came clean. Although Veolia were not hired to look into lead, they failed to mention this severe health problem, and their silence contributed to the crisis. Veolia are currently facing lawsuits for their misconduct, allegations which they refute. But whatever the case, this shows the core issue of having a private corporation involved in a public utility. In the leaked emails, it is clear that those who wanted to blow the whistle were hampered by business interests. As I said earlier, the origins of Veolia lie in trying to deal with public health crises in the 1850s, but now, Veolia is creating public health emergencies. In recent years, a more coordinated international campaign has sprung up against Veolia. In Tower Hamlets, London, local government officials reviewed contracts following the company's involvement in illegal Israeli settlements. Across America, but particularly within Seattle, campaigners have successfully managed to prevent Veolia taking over local transport routes. The biggest win has been enforcing Veolia to withdraw from its illegal Israeli settlements. And yet, Veolia continues to operate essential services to profit and are morphing into a quasi-governmental organisation. They now consult closely with the UN, shaping resource policies on a committee alongside Coca-Cola and Nestle, corporations infamous for their history of water mismanagement. It's also interesting how, through nebulous international monetary fund policies, Veolia has taken control of numerous poorer nations' water services, in many cases, directly retracing their founders' colonial empire. At the top of this essay, I presented the strands of Veolia's operation and its history as the stuff of conspiracy. Conspiratorial thought has been spreading exponentially, as citizens worldwide feel scorned by a political landscape that evidently fails them. But most conspiracies, consisting of elaborate schemes, spread through social media, obscure a far more vindictive and systematic push to enrich a few people at the detriment of the health, finances and self-determination of others. No individual in Veolia embodies this negative impact for themselves, nor does the business consciously seek to do harm. But listen to what Henri Simeon proclaimed to shareholders at the company's inception. We shall be opening up a mine, the world for which has not been explored. As the first occupants of this mine, it will be our privilege to select and exploit the best seams. Veolia's present motto is, resourcing the world. But in their own words, from their inception, they have been exploiting it.